Today we got some actual history about a gang of highwaymen who terrorized the mining towns of Idaho and Montana in the early 1860s. We'll read about these outlaws and about the group of vigilantes who eventually arose to oppose them. We'll be reading from this book, Vigilante Days and Ways, published all the way back in 1890. The author of this book, Nathaniel Pitt Langford, lived in these mining towns around the same time, and he joined one of the vigilance committees that eventually brought their own brand of justice to the gang of ruffians led by this man, Henry Plummer. In this episode, we'll first hear the author explain why some of the actions of the vigilantes were necessary, and then we'll read about the crimes committed by this gang, beginning around 1861. It is stated on good authority that soon after the first appearance of Schiller's drama of The Robbers, a number of young men, charmed with the character of Charles de Moore, formed a band and went to the forests of Bohemia to engage in brigand life. I have no fear that such will be the influence of this volume. It deals in facts. Robber life as delineated by the vivid fancy of Schiller, and robber life as it existed in our mining regions, were as widely separated as fiction and truth. No one can read this record of events and escape the conviction that an honest, laborious, and well-meaning life, whether successful or not, is preferable to all the temporary enjoyments of a life of recklessness and crime. The truth of the adage that crime carries with it its own punishments has never received a more powerful vindication than at the tribunals erected by the people of the Northwest Mines for their own protection. No sadder commentary could have stained our civilization than to permit the numerous and bloody crimes committed in the early history of this portion of our country to go unwhipped of justice. And the fact that they were promptly and thoroughly dealt with stands among the earliest and noblest characteristics of a people which derive their ideas of right and of self-protection from that spirit of the law that flows spontaneously from our free institutions. The people bore with crime until punishment became a duty, and neglect a crime. Then, at infinite hazard of failure, they entered upon the work of purgation with a strong hand, and in the briefest possible time established the supremacy of law. The robbers and murderers of the mining regions, so long defiant of the claims of peace and safety, were made to hold the gibbet in greater terror there than in any other portion of our country. Up to this time, fear of punishment had exercised no restraining influence on the conduct of men who had organized murder and robbery into a steady pursuit. They hesitated at no atrocity necessary to accomplish their guilty designs. Murder with them was resorted to as the most available means of concealing robbery, and the two crimes were generally coincident. The country filled with canyons, gulches, and mountain passes was especially adapted to their purposes, and the unpeopled distances between mining camps afforded ample opportunity for carrying them into execution. Pack trains and companies, stagecoaches and express messengers were as much exposed as a solitary traveler and often selected as objects of attack. Miners who had spent months of hard labor in the placers and the accumulation of a few hundreds of dollars were never heard of after they left the mines to return to their distant homes. Men were daily and nightly robbed and murdered in the camps. There was no limit to this system of organized brigandage. When not engaged in robbery, this criminal population followed other disreputable pursuits. Gambling and licentiousness were the most conspicuous features of every mining camp, and both were but other species of robbery. Worthless women taken from the stews of cities plied their vocation in open day, and their banyos were the lures where many men were entrapped for robbery and slaughter. Dance houses sprung up as if by enchantment, and everyone who sought an evening's recreation in them was in some way relieved of the money he took there. 
Many good men who dared to give expression to the feelings of horror and disgust which these exhibitions inspired were shot down by some member of the gang on the first opportunity. For a long time these acts were unnoticed, for the reason that the friends of law and order supposed the power of evil to be in the ascendant. Encouraged by this impunity, the ruffian power increased in audacity and gave utterance to threats against all that portion of the community which did not belong to to its organization. I offer these remarks not in vindication of all the acts of the vigilantes, but of so many of them as were necessary to establish the safety and protection of the people. The reader will find among the later acts of some of the individuals claiming to have exercised the authority of the vigilantes, some executions of which he cannot approve. For these persons I can offer no apology. Many of these were worse men than those they executed. Some were hasty and inconsiderate. And and while firm in the belief that they were doing right, actually committed grievous offenses themselves. Unhappily for the vigilantes, the acts of these men have been recalled to justify an opinion abroad, prejudicial to the vigilante organization. Nothing could be more unjust. The early vigilantes were the best and most intelligent men in the mining regions. They saw and felt that, in the absence of all law, they must become a law unto themselves, or submit to the bloody code of the banditti by which they were surrounded, and which was increasing in numbers more rapidly than themselves. Every man among them realized from the first the great delicacy and care necessary in the management of a society which assumed the right to condemn to death a fellow man, and they now refer to the history of all those men who suffered death by their decree as affording ample justification for the severity of their acts. What else could they do? How else were their own lives and property and the lives and property of the great body of peaceable miners and the placers to be preserved? What other protection was there for a country entirely destitute of law? Let those who would condemn these men try to realize how they would act under similar circumstances, and they will soon find everything to approve and nothing to condemn in the transactions of the early vigilantes. I have endeavored to narrate nothing but facts, and these will enable every reader to judge correctly of the merits of each case. I would fain believe that this history, bloody as it is, will prove both interesting and instructive, and in all that concerns the crime of the blackest die on the one hand, and the love for law and order on the other, it stands without a parallel in the annals of any people. Nowhere else, nor at any period since men became civilized, have murder and robbery and social vice presented an organized front and offered an open contest for supremacy to a large civilized community. Their works for centuries have been done by stealth, in darkness, and as far away from society as possible. I cannot now remember the instance within the past 300 years when the history of any country records the fact that the criminal element of an entire community, numbering thousands, was believed to be greater than the peaceful element, yet it was so here, and when the vigilantes of Montana entered upon their work, they did not know how soon they might have to encounter a force that was numerically greater than their own. In my view, the moral of this history is a good one. The brave and faithful conduct of the vigilantes furnishes an example of American character from a point of view entirely new. We know what our countrymen were capable of doing when exposed to Indian massacre. We have read history after history recording the sufferings of early pioneers in the East, South, and West. But what would they do when surrounded by robbers and assassins who are in all civil aspects like the themselves. It has remained for the first settlers of the northwestern mines to tell, and that they did their work well, and showed in every act a love for law, order, and for the moral and social virtues in which they had been educated, and a regard for our free institutions, no one can doubt who rightly appreciates the motives which actuated them. A people who had not been reared to respect law and order, and to regard the privileges which flow from a free government as greater than all others in the regulation of society, would have been restrained by fear from any such united and thorough effort as that which in Montana actually scourged crime out of existence, and secured to an organized community all the immunities and blessings of good government. 
The terror which popular justice inspired in the criminal community has never been forgotten. To this day, crime has been less frequent in occurrence in Montana than in any of the new territories, and no banded criminals have made that territory an abiding place. Although not the first exhibition of vigilante justice, the one I here record was the most thorough and severe, and stands as an example for all new settlements that in the future may be similarly afflicted, for it was not until driven to it by both the frequent and undermenting villainies of the ruffians, and by the necessities of a condition for which there was no law in existence, that the people resorted to measures of their own and made an enforced law suited to the exigency. But enough, if the history fails to remove the prejudices of my readers, nothing I can say will do so. It speaks for itself, and though there are a few of its later occurrences I would gladly blot, there is nothing in its early transactions, nothing in the design it unfolds, nothing in the results which have followed, that on a similar occasion I would not wish to see reproduced. Our civil war was raging at the time that Lewiston became a mining emporium. Sympathizers with each party fled to the mines to escape the possible responsibilities they might incur by remaining in the states. They carried their political views with them and identified themselves with those portions of society which reflected their respective attachments. Loyalty and secession each flourished by turn, and were the prolific causes of frequent bloody dissensions. There was no law to restrain human passion, so that each man was a law unto himself, according as he was swayed by the evil or good of his own nature. The temptations to evil, not so numerous, were much more powerful than were ever before presented to a great majority of the immigrants. Gambling and drinking were made attractive by the presence of debased women, who lured to their ruin all who, fortunate in the possession of gold, could not withstand their varied devices. In the spring of 1861, among the daily arrivals at Lewiston was a man of gentlemanly bearing and dignified deportment, accompanied by a lady, to all appearances his wife. He took quarters at the best hotel in town. Before the close of the second day after his arrival, his character as a gambler was fully understood and in less than a fortnight, his abandonment of his female companion betrayed the illicit connection which had existed between them. Alone among strangers, destitute, the poor woman told how she had been beguiled by the promises of this man, from home and family, and induced to link herself with his fortunes. A fond husband and three helpless children mourned her loss by a visitation worse than death. Lacking moral courage to return to her heartbroken husband and ask forgiveness, she sought to drown her sorrow by plunging still deeper into the abyss of shame and ruin. Soon, alas, she became one of the lowest inmates of a frontier brothel. This latest crime of Henry Plummer was soon forgotten, or remembered only as one of many similar events which occur in mining camps. He, meanwhile, in the pursuit of his profession as a gambler, formed the acquaintance of many congenial spirits. From their subsequent operations, it was also apparent that at his instigation an alliance was formed with them, which had for its object the attainment of fortune by the most desperate means. Every fortunate man in any of the mining camps was marked as the prey, sooner or later, of this abandoned combination. Every gambler or rough infesting the camp, either voluntarily or by threats, was induced to unite in the enterprise. And thus originated the band of desperados which, for the succeeding two years, by their fearful atrocities, spread such terror through the northern mines. Plummer was their acknowledged leader. Professional gamblers everywhere in a new country form a community by themselves. They have few intimates outside of their own number. A sort of tacit understanding among them links them together by certain implied rules and regulations which they readily obey. Of the same nature, we may suppose, was the bond which united Plummer and his associates in their infernal designs of plunder and butchery. The honor which thieves accord each other, the prospect of unlimited reward for their vicious deeds, and the certainty of condign punishment for any act of treachery, secured the band and its purposes against any betrayal by its members. 
Nowhere are the conventionalities of social life sooner abandoned than in a mining camp. To call a man by his proper name there generally implies that he is either a stranger or one with whom you do not care to make acquaintance. The gamblers were generally known by diminutive surnames or appellations significant of their characters. I shall so designate those of whom were thus known in this narrative. Prominent among the associates of Plummer at Lewiston were Jack Cleveland, Cherokee Bob, and Bill Bunton. Cleveland was an old California acquaintance familiar with Plummer's early history. He used this fatal knowledge, as it afterwards proved, in a dictatorial and offensive manner, often presuming upon it to arrogate a position in the band which by common consent was assigned to Plummer. Cherokee Bob was a native Georgian and received his name from the fact that he was a quarter-blood Indian. He was bitter in his hatred of the loyal cause and all who engaged in it. Before he came to Lewiston, he had, in an affray of his own plotting, killed two or three soldiers in the Walla Walla Theater. He fled to Lewiston to escape the vengeance of their comrades. Bill Bunton was a double-dyed murderer and notorious horse and cattle thief. He had killed a man at a ball near Walla Walla, was tried for murder and acquitted on insufficient evidence. He afterwards killed his brother-in-law, and in cold blood soon shot down an Indian and escaped the clutches of the law by flight. Possessing himself of a ranch on Pataha Creek, he lived there with his Indian wife under the pretext of farming. It was soon ascertained, however, that his business was secreting and selling stolen stock. The officers made a dash upon his ranch, but the bird had again flown. Soon afterwards, disguised in the blanket and paint of an Indian, he entered Lewiston and lounged about the streets for several days, without exciting suspicion. During this time, he became a member of Plummer's murderous band. There were several others whose names are unknown that entered into the combination form for systematized robbery and murder at the time. Around this nucleus, a large number of desperate men afterwards gathered. They became so formidable in numbers and their deeds of blood were so frequent and daring that the mining camps were awed by them into tacit submission and witnessed without even remonstrance the perpetration of murders and robberies in their very midst of the most revolting character. Towards the close of summer 1862, the band organized by Plummer, having increased in numbers, he selected two points of rendezvous as basis for their operations. These were called shebangs. They were enclosed by mountains whose rugged fastnesses were available for refuge in case of attack. One was located between Alpoi and Pataha Creeks, on the road from Lewiston to Walla Walla, about 25 miles from the former, and the other at the foot of Craig's Mountain, between Lewiston and Orofino, at a point where the main road was intersected by a trail for pack animals. The location of the latter was upon ground reserved by treaty to the Nez Perce Indians, and near a military post established for its protection. The chief of the tribe complained to the resident agent of the Indians of this aggression. He laid the complaint before the commandant of the post who treated it with neglect. The robbers occupied the spot without molestation, and when they abandoned it, it was of their own accord. There were several smaller stations nearer to Walla Walla and Lewiston, which were only occupied as occasion might require. A close communication was established between these localities, by which the operations of each were speedily known to all. Plummer, meantime, while secretly directing the affairs of the shebangs and issuing orders continually to the men, contrived to ward off suspicion from himself and preserve the appearance of a harmless and inoffensive citizen of Lewiston. His notoriety as a gambler was shared by so many better men, and by a great majority of the miners themselves, that it really protected him in his character as a robber. While, therefore, he was prying into the financial condition of those with whom his profession brought him in daily contact with in town, he was at the same time informing his confederates at the shebangs of every departure which boded success to their enterprise. Such of the population as were not, to a greater or less degree, involved in the gambling operations of the community, although perfectly cognizant of the designs of the robbers, were too insignificant in numbers to offer any active opposition. 
Being without organization, they hardly knew each other. Such was the state of feeling that if a gambler or rough desired to possess any of the articles on sale by merchants or grocers, he entered a store, selected for himself the best assortment afforded, and took it away with a request that it should be charged, or stated that some day when he was in luck, he would then pay for it. Rather than risk and affray, the dealer submitted to the imposition. Payment was generally made, the gamblers entertaining among themselves a standard of honor in such matters which it was considered disgraceful to violate. The two roads upon which the shebangs were located were the only thoroughfares in the country, and not a day passed in which they were not traversed by people in going to and returning from the interior mining camps, and in coming into and departing from the country. The number of robberies and murders committed by the banditti will never be known. Mysterious disappearances soon became of almost weekly occurrence. The danger which every man incurred of being robbed or killed was demonstrated by numerous escapes made by horsemen who had been assaulted and fired upon and escaped by the fleetness of their horses. It was fully understood that whoever passed over either of these roads would have to run the gauntlet in the neighborhood of the shebangs, and people generally went prepared. Crime was fearfully on the increase all through the secluded districts, which separated the river from the distant mining camps. The country itself about equally made up of mountains, foothills, canyons, dense pine forests, lava beds, and deep river channels was as favorable for the commission of crime as for the concealment of its perpetrators. The two shebangs were swarmed with ruffians. On one occasion, a party of half a dozen while riding in the vicinity of Craig's Mountain were stopped by a volley from the shebang which, being harmless, was returned. A number of well-mounted robbers started in pursuit. The party escaped by hard spurring, one of the number to lighten his burden throwing several large bags of gold dust into the grass. They were afterwards recovered. A butcher by the name of Harkness of Orofino was also assaulted and fired upon. He owed his deliverance to the fleetness of his horse. Owners of pack trains never attempted to pass without force sufficient to intimidate the robbers. The other shebang was used as a receptacle for stolen horses. It was under the superintendence of a noted horse thief by the name of Turner, who had been a partner in the business with Bill Bunton. Any member of the band whose claim to recognition was founded upon success in any thieving or bloody enterprise could leave his jaded steed here in exchange for a fresh one. A single incident will illustrate the manner in which many of the horses were obtained. A gentleman riding a beautiful young mare on his way from Oregon to Orofino, while she was drinking from the stream nearby, was suddenly confronted by a man who claimed her as his property. Several persons were witnesses to the meeting. Drawing a bill of sale of the mayor from his pocket, which he had obtained 500 miles away, he dismounted and was about to prove his ownership when the ruffian jumped into the saddle and seizing the bridle rode rapidly away. The wayfarer called upon the bystanders to assist in the recapture of the animal, instead of which they knocked him down, stripped him of everything in his pockets, and told him to leave. He entered Lewiston utterly destitute. No occupation in the northern mines tested the courage and honesty of men more severely than that of the express riders. Their duties in riding from camp to camp frequently for hundreds of miles where there was not a dwelling, carrying large amounts of treasure made them objects of frequent attacks. Tried men were selected for this business, men as well known for personal bravery as for their adroitness in the use of weapons in personal encounter. The notoriety of this class was sufficient as a general thing to protect them from attack, unless it could be made under every possible advantage. It is a remarkable fact and speaks as little in favor of the courage of the desperados as in praise of the daring nobility of these early express riders that few of the latter were interrupted in the discharge of their dangerous duties. They were ever upon the alert. It was the work of an instant only when attacked for them to draw and discharge their revolvers with deadly effect and follow up the smallest advantage with the no less fatal bowie knife. One man has been known in an encounter of this kind to kill four assailants and escape unharmed. 
Tracy and Company of Lewiston had a Pony Express route from that town to Salmon River, a distance of 75 miles. Their messenger, whom we only know by the name of Mos, was a man of great intrepidity and perfectly familiar with all the risks of his business. In single encounter, he was understood to be more than a match for any man in the mountains. Sometime in the early fall of 1862, a plan was laid by Plummer and his associates to capture Mos. The place selected for the purpose was the trail crossing of White Bird Creek, at a distance of 60 miles from Lewiston and 18 from Salmon River. At this point, the creek runs between very abrupt banks, densely covered with cottonwoods, rendering both descent and ascent tedious and difficult. The robbers, in anticipation of the arrival of Mos, as usual on a keen lope, after darkness had set in, had felled a tree across the trail. At a sufficient height to admit the passage of the horse, and at the same time strike the rider in the chest, and throw him suddenly from the saddle. They then intended to kill him and rob his cantinas, which it was supposed would contain several thousand dollars in gold dust. At Chapman's Ranch near the crossing, Most was told that several suspicious characters had been prowling in the neighborhood during the afternoon, and with that keen sense, which had been educated to scent danger from afar, he at once comprehended the whole plot. Carefully descending the bank, he discovered the snare, and turning to the left avoided it, hurried through the creek and ascending the opposite bank cast a look of derision back upon the foiled highwayman. This fearless messenger continued in service long after this event, but his future trips were made under the escort of well-armed assistants. Winters are nowhere more dreary than among the miners. Frost and snow bring their labors to an end, and for three or four months they either remain in their camps in a state of listless inactivity, or seek for occupation and enjoyment in the excesses of the nearest populous settlement. Hundreds of them actually squander during the season of winter all that they have obtained by the most severe toil during the rest of that year. With a terrible example constantly before him, he must be a man of resolute will who can long refrain from embracing vice in all its forms. Gambling becomes a favorite occupation, and whiskey a common beverage. The society of abandoned women lures him on until every moral, social, and virtuous resolution is broken down, and the experience of a few months of such a life wholly unfits him for a return to his earlier pursuits. This is the experience of nine-tenths of the young men who seek for fortune among the gold mines. Most of this class, who had been occupied in placer digging during the summer and fall, at the first approach of cold forsook their mines and crowded into Lewiston to spend the winter, bringing with them the hard earnings of their toil. Following in their wake came the professional gamblers and sports, and mingling with the common mass were the wretches who had reached the lowest depths of human depravity. A letter from one of the early settlers of Lewiston written at the time says, Late in 1862, a large number congregated here to pass the winter. About 75% of these were cutthroats, robbers, gamblers, and escaped convicts. Honest men were in a fearful minority, and dared not lisp of the arrest and punishment of criminals. The villains had their own way in everything. I record the following as an incident which will better illustrate the condition of society than anything I can write. A gambler named Kirby borrowed of another a revolver. Secretly withdrawing the cartridges from it, an hour later he returned it and requested the owner to lend him a few ounces of gold dust, which was declined. Knowing that he had the money, Kirby, enraged at the refusal, put the muzzle of a loaded revolver to his temple and blew out his brains. No arrest was attempted. The cold-blooded, midday murderer walked the streets of town during the entire winter, mingled in the sports, and escaped unwhipped of justice. Three years afterwards he was arrested in Oregon, and turned over to the Idaho authorities, upon the requisition of Governor Lyon, but no witnesses appearing against him he was suffered to go at large. 
In a state of society where the majority of people depend upon vicious pursuits for a livelihood, want and destitution are the natural elements. Increase of crime in all its forms follows. All through the winter of 1861 and 1862, and until returns began to come in from the mines the following spring, Lewiston was daily and nightly a theater where the entire calendar of crime was exhibited in epitome. Murders were frequent, robberies and thefts constant, gambling, debauchery, drunkenness, and all their attendant evils openly flaunted in the face of day and in defiance of law. Money and food were so scarce that robbery with the sporting community became an actual necessity. How to protect themselves against it sorely taxed the wit and tried the courage of the unfortunate property holders. Canvas walls offered slight resistance to determined thieves, and life was not protected by them from murderous bullets. An exemplification is furnished in the following incident. A German named Hiltebrandt kept a saloon in a large canvas building in the center of the town. It was the principal rendezvous for the Germans and a popular retail establishment. Hiltebrandt was known to possess a considerable amount of coin and gold dust, which the roughs resolved to appropriate. The barriers in the way involved only the possible murder of the owner and two friends who occupied a large bed in the front of the saloon. Between 12 and 1 o'clock, in one of the coldest nights of the first week of January, the door was suddenly broken from its hinges, and a volley of balls fired in the direction of the bed. Hiltebrandt was instantly killed. His two companions, after returning the fire of the ruffians, seized the treasure and escaped. One of the villains was wounded in the finger. When the firing ceased, the robbers coolly entered the building, lit a candle, and proceeded to search for the money. Finding none, they departed, uttering curses upon their ill fortune, not, however, until several citizens appeared upon the scene and witnessed the enormity of their crime. The murderers passed fearlessly and unconcernedly through the crowd, no effort being made to arrest them, lest a rescue might be attempted, which would prove fatal to all concerned, and possibly result in the burning of the town. This was the first effort at self-protection made by the people. The moment was a trying one. All knew that the roughs were in the majority, and none were bold enough to recommend open resistance to their encroachments, for fear of consequences. Henry Plummer took an active part in the proceedings, depicting with fervid eloquence the horrors of anarchy, and solemnly warning the people to take no steps that might bring disgrace and obloquy upon their rising young city. Known as a gambler only, and suspected by few of any darker associations, his winning manner had the effect to squelch in its inception the initiatory movement, which at no distant period was to burst forth and whelm him with hundreds of his bloody associates in its avenging vortex. The brother of the murdered Hiltebrandt was in business at this time at the Orofino Mines. Hearing of the murder, he openly avowed the intention of going immediately to Lewiston to bring the authors to justice. The banditti sent him a message that he would not live to get there, which had the effect to daunt him from his purpose, and the assassins, for the time, escaped punishment. The daring, adventurous, and courageous elements of character are necessarily developed and brought into frequent action in a mining country, and whenever these are found in combination with high moral principle, they are held in continual fear by men of criminal life. One bold, honest man will demoralize the guilty designs of a host of rascals. Nothing was so much dreaded by Plummer's murderous gang as the possible organization of a vigilance committee, and any man who favored it was marked for early destruction. Such a man was Patrick Ford, the keeper of a saloon in Lewiston. Ford was an active man in his own business, eager in the pursuit of gain but entirely upright in his dealings, and the open and avowed enemy of the roughs. He, more than any other member of the community, had urged the people of Lewiston to unite for their protection and hang every suspected individual in the place, and he taunted them with cowardice when they disbanded without punishing the known murderers of Hiltebrandt. 
As fearless as he was uncompromising, he denounced the ruffians in person and warned them that a time would come ere long when they would meet at the hands of an outraged people their deserts. He did not conceal from them his intention of following in the track of the prosperous miner, lead where it might, which purpose they resolved to prevent. His death they regarded as necessary to their future prosperity. Having ascertained that he intended to leave Lewiston with a half dozen dancing girls for the saloon he had established at Orofino, they laid a plan to insult him and involve him in a quarrel on his arrival at their shebang, and then kill him. Ford was admonished of the design, which he foiled by avoiding the shebang. Being assured of his safe passage to Orofino, the robbers led by Plummer, Ridgely, and Reeves mounted their horses and started for the interior. Of the particular events of the early part of the trip, farther than it was marked by frequent robbery of travelers, I am unable to speak. Within seven or eight miles of Orofino, the robbers observed two Frenchmen, some distance apart, approaching them on foot. The one in advance was ordered to stop and throw up his hands, as in that position he was powerless and could not offer any resistance. After a careful search of his person, they found nothing of value, and bade him move on as rapidly as possible, telling him that it was a rough country to be in without money, and that he had better get out of it as soon as possible. With the other, whom they subjected to a like process, they were more fortunate, and despite a solemn denial found in his pocket, a purse containing a thousand dollars in dust, which they appropriated, dismissing him with the remark that if he had done the square thing and not lied, they would have given him enough to take him to the Columbia River, but as it was, he might be thankful to get off with a whole carcass. Some idea may be formed of the daring and recklessness of this robbery when it is understood to have occurred at midday, near a town containing a population of several thousands, and on a thoroughfare thronged with travelers. Uttering a shout of exultation, the robbers dashed into the town of Orofino, with the impetuosity of a cavalry charge. Reining up in front of Ford's saloon, which they entered, they called loudly upon the barkeeper for liquor. Ford was absent. When they had drunk, they commenced demolishing the contents of the saloon. Decanters, tumblers, chairs, and tables were broken and scattered over the apartment. One of their number, more fiendish than the others, seized a lapdog from one of the females and cut off his tail. At this juncture, Ford himself came upon the scene. Boldly confronting the rioters, pistol in hand, he ordered them instantly to leave his premises. He charged them with the robbery of the Frenchmen, and denounced them as thieves, robbers, and murderers. They saw and feared his determination, and obeyed his commands with alacrity. He followed them into the street, and threatened them with punishment if they remained in town. They were about to act upon this hint, when Ford, fully armed, came to them a second time, and demanded the cause of their delay. He was answered with a bullet, inflicting a dangerous wound. The fire was returned and the fight became general, three against one. The robbers were protected by their horses, while their antagonist was openly exposed to their fire. Ford emptied the charges from one six-shooter, made five shots with the other, and was in the act of aiming for the last when he fell dead, riddled with the balls of his adversaries. Ridgely was shot through the leg twice, and Plummer's horse disabled. Such was the melancholy fate to Patrick Ford, a man long to be remembered as the friend of law and order, the first, indeed, in the northern mines who dared to urge the extermination of the robbers as the only remedy for their depredations. He literally sealed his principles with his life's blood. Ridgely's wounds disabled him for service. He was taken by his companions to a ranch near the town, and as well cared for as circumstances would admit. Leaving him there, the other members of the band, fearful of the friends of Ford, seldom ventured beyond the limits of their camp. 
So that's it for this episode. This is episode one in a series I will be doing based on this book, Vigilante Days and Ways by Nathaniel Pitt Langford. Here we read about the deaths of many men at the hands of Henry Plummer's gang, including the deaths of two saloon keepers, Hiltebrandt and Patrick Ford, who had been very open in his attempts to form a vigilance committee to hang the murderers of Hiltebrandt. In the next episode in this series, we'll hear about more crimes committed by Plummer's gang of roughs and some of the first vigilante justice administered to the gang. This channel is called Unworthy History because we cover actual history that is unworthy of history channels on TV. Stay tuned to this channel if you like hearing about actual history directly from old books. So if you want to see more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.